It's Thursday, October 6th. They have two things in common. They want to help hurricane victims, and they don't want to be compared to Donald Trump. We start here. Two bitter political rivals come together in Florida to survey hurricane damage. It was something that you almost never see these days, this rare moment of bipartisanship and bipartisan praise. So what else did President Joe Biden and Governor Ron DeSantis have to talk about? How high are gas prices? Well, not high enough, according to OPEC. Now you have OPEC members working together with Russia, in essence. The group that controls oil production wants less supply and more demand. And lots of parents started homeschooling in 2020, but more are still joining them. My youngest son lasted until first grade, but he was actually uh, a victim of racism in kindergarten. Why black families in particular are opting to trade lockers for living rooms. From ABC News, this is Start Here. I'm Brad Milkey. I'm a great respecter of fate. Fate has intervened in my life many, many times. President Biden has been pretty clear. Unless he has some unforeseen health issue, he plans on running for re-election in 2024. On the Republican side, there are really two obvious names to challenge him. One of them, you know. In 2024, we are going to take back our magnificent White House. The other is a man who's been called a MAGA Republican with more discipline. A columnist for the Idaho State Journal called him Trump with a brain. We are not going to surrender to woke. We are going to prevail. And Florida is the state where woke goes to die. Florida Governor Ron DeSantis has seized a lot on the issues gripping the Republican Party. He's ardently in favor of gun rights. He's opposed to raising taxes on pretty much anything. But perhaps more significantly, he is out in front of the emotional issues galvanizing the country. We've had millions of people Millions of people come across illegally since Biden has been president. He's not just angry about the border. He's shuttling migrants to prove a point. He doesn't just want independence from Washington. He's asserted control over local jurisdictions who dared follow CDC recommendations. He's unapologetically blasted public school boards. We are not going to use your tax dollars to teach our kids to hate this country or to hate each other. It's not hard to see where this is going. Ron DeSantis wants Joe Biden's job. Republicans are playing politics with human beings, using them as props. What they're doing is simply wrong. It's un-American, it's reckless. And despite efforts to ignore him, Biden clearly sees DeSantis as a threat. But then, Hurricane Ian came. Suddenly, gone were the social issues. DeSantis was all about safety and logistics. Biden was all about federal assistance. And with DeSantis humbly asking for federal aid, he invited President Biden to Florida to survey the damage. The question was, would they even look at each other, let alone shake hands? ABC senior White House correspondent Mary Bruce was on hand for this. She is in Fort Myers, Florida. Mary, these two clearly don't like each other, so everyone was kind of wondering if there would be like a dust-up. That clearly did not seem to happen. No, quite the opposite. In fact, it was something that you almost never see these days, this rare moment of bipartisanship and bipartisan praise. We are cutting through the red tape, uh, and that's from local government, state government, all the way up uh, to the president. So we appreciate uh, the, the team effort. We've seen extraordinary cooperation uh, at every level of government, as the governor has said, and the cooperation began before the storm hit. It's not just that they spent some time together. These real foes. I mean, DeSantis is one of the president's most vocal, harshest critics. It's no secret that Joe Biden is not a fan of Ron DeSantis either. And yet here they were sharing praise, heaping praise in some ways on each other. I mean, the president saying that they've worked hand in glove on this response, noting that they have very different political philosophies, but saying that when it comes to this crisis, they've been in lockstep. The administration has approved now 60 days of 100 percent reimbursement for debris removal. You have some of these communities here, their their bill for debris removal will likely be more than their annual budgets. And so this is really, really significant help. So we thank them for doing that. This I is how this is supposed to work. Uh, and sometimes it's important to pause and recognize that too. It's almost confusing to hear you say this, Mary, because these guys have basically, especially DeSantis, have said that the other guy's not qualified to hold the office that he's in. I don't know. Is this just me projecting kind of the vibe of when Donald Trump was in office, he would openly refuse to be seen with people that disagreed with him politically? Is that why I find this so bizarre? Or are there reasons to think it's not all kumbaya between them? 
I would describe it more as a detente. This is a pause in their rivalry. I don't know how long it will last, but I doubt it will last very long. You know, I think, yes, on one hand, we have gotten very used to seeing political rivals go after each other, especially in the post-Trump era. On the flip side of that, we are very close to a midterm election. Ron DeSantis is running in this critical governor race here. So it's not unheard of to think that we would see them butting heads, especially as we have seen Ron DeSantis really campaign in many ways against Joe Biden. Biden's forgotten about the crisis at our southern border. I can tell you that uh, Biden has forgotten about the inflation that's biting the budgets of families all throughout our country. And of course, the big X factor here is that we all know that Ron DeSantis wants Joe Biden's job. So that makes uh, it even more unusual to see the two of them side by side saying, you know, the other one has done a good job here. Are there liabilities for these guys to be seen working so closely with each other? Like from the left, you got people telling President Biden, like, we, we really need you to be like a climate change warrior. On the right, there are clear questions about like, didn't DeSantis try to block funding for Hurricane Sandy victims in the wake of that storm in the Northeast and the blue states? Like, like, what are the political realities right now for these guys? Yeah, look, when he was a congressman back in 2013, Ron DeSantis was very clear that he did not want to give a federal bailout for, for the New York region after Hurricane Sandy. He thought that was irresponsible, that, you know, was in line with his thinking, right, that he didn't believe that the federal government should just be a, a blank check for states, even if they were recovering from horrific disasters. Now, of course, he is asking the federal government for aid in this situation. And so he has faced some blowback for that. Isn't it socialism when the, the government helps you? Uh, and uh, <laughs> so they say... Like Social Security and you have yeah. seen you know, a lot of criticism across the board for members of the left who, who say they're fed up with Republican governors all of a sudden requesting aid and help to rebuild states after we see disasters, environmental disasters. There's a lot going on. And I think the one thing this has finally ended is a discussion about whether or not there's climate change and we should do something about it. When they say they're not actually serious about actually addressing the root causes of a lot of these disasters, and that means climate change. Right, which then leads to questions from within each party, right? Like the, the left telling Biden, you got to be harder on these guys. And from the right saying, hey, if you're really concerned about deficits, if you're really concerned about spending in the middle of these highly charged moments, why doesn't it apply to Florida? Mary Bruce, they're traveling with the president. Thank you so much. Thanks, Brad. Perhaps the biggest issue in the American economy is inflation, right? It's the reason your stuff costs more. It's the reason the Fed has raised interest rates. It's the reason you might not be able to get a mortgage. And that is the reason some businesses are scaling back their hiring. And yet one of the chief drivers of inflation in this country, the price of gasoline, has been awfully hard to predict. For a while, it was falling so fast, it was single-handedly keeping inflation rates down. Well, now it's back on the move. In fact, the other day, we saw signs in LA advertising $8 a gallon. We don't know what to do. Because because the, the prices are increasing every single day. Well, gas apparently isn't expensive enough for the countries that make up OPEC. That's the Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries. They basically control nearly half the world's oil supply. And yesterday, they voted to restrict the flow of oil to make prices higher. ABC's Alexis Christophorus covers business and economics. Alexis, there are reports the White House was kind of all hands on deck to make sure this didn't happen. It happened anyway. How big of a deal was this? Well, uh, pretty big. We were looking at a million barrels a day being cut from world markets, uh, but OPEC made that two million barrels through 2023. The actual cut, though, Brad, is going to be about half that because producers have already uh, not been meeting their production targets, but it still remains a pretty large cut. And, you know, OPEC's job is to stabilize prices on the global market. And they've said that sort of their sweet spot is having crude oil at around $90 a barrel. They say that will uh, make it less likely that world economies would become destabilized. We are not endangering the energy markets. We are providing security, stability to the energy markets. At a price. Uh, everything has a price. Energy security has a price as well. We actually saw crude spike above $100 a barrel, and that's when we saw that big jump in gas prices uh, back in June when the national average in this country was over $5 a gallon. But since then, gas prices have fallen, and we've seen crude at around $70, $75 a barrel. So this is their attempt uh, to bring those prices higher. Do we know how much higher the average price of gasoline would be because of this? Like, is there a direct correlation between oil and gas there? You know, it's not really black and white mm -hmm. in terms of how much is this going to translate 
uh, into at the pump because gas prices tend to be very regional. You know, in California, we've seen prices be much higher than the national average for a long time now. The average in California now is six forty two a gallon, and in some places, it's even been as high as eight dollars a gallon. And that's because they've had some refinery issues on the West Coast. As those get resolved, prices there should actually start to come down. Mm. But elsewhere, like in the Northeast and the South, we could be looking at gas prices rising anywhere from fifteen to thirty cents a gallon in. The matter of weeks, this OPEC production cut is supposed to go into effect in November. And why, like, I hear you say that they want the price to be a certain thing, but the U.S. can't be the only country feeling an economic pinch right now, right? Can you just put me in the mindset of some of these countries who, like, they got to be feeling backlash for, from the U.S. and from some other countries, right? Right. I mean, you basically have Europe, the U.S., and the U.K. trying to push back on high oil prices. They're all dealing with high inflation, really the world over. Uh, but they're also trying to um, squash efforts by Russia uh, in their war on Ukraine, another big reason why we've seen a big rise in, in oil prices. Uh, but now you have OPEC members, 33 in all, uh, 23 for regular OPEC members and 10 uh, on that plus side, the OPEC plus, um, you know, working together with Russia, in essence, to help support the war in Ukraine. I mean, when you raise global oil prices, um, that is by de facto helping Russia get more revenue stream and finance their war in Ukraine. OPEC's decision uh, to cut production's quotas is short-sighted. It's interesting that the Biden administration called this cut by OPEC short-sighted because when you look at um, the fact that gas prices have been a big contributor to overall inflation and the Federal Reserve is trying to combat high inflation by rising interest rates. If this becomes a vicious cycle, the Fed may continue to raise rates even more and that is going to actually put pressure on world economies, including the economies uh, involved in OPEC. So it, it could be a bad story, not just for the U.S., not just for Europe, but globally. Yeah, and you see the kind of these diplomatic pressures taking effect just as much as the economic ones. Alexis Christophorus, thank you so much. Thank you. It's no secret that homeschooling became more of a thing during the pandemic. It felt dangerous to be in a classroom. It felt depressing watching kids struggle on Zoom. And heck, lots of parents couldn't go into work as usual. So they figured, might as well homeschool my kids. What I did not realize, though, is that homeschooling has actually increased even after schools reopened their doors. More than a million children have been taken out of public school since 2019, with parents deciding to teach them at home instead. And it's not just the numbers. There are also new demographics of Americans who are homeschooling their kids. And ABC Steve Osinsami went to Birmingham, Alabama to meet what has become an increasing share of black American families teaching lessons in-house. Steve's with us now. And Steve, I was really blown away by these numbers. So how many kids are being homeschooled this year in the U.S.? So by some estimates, and this is using information from the U.S. Census Bureau, there are approximately 5 million American children who are being homeschooled this year, this school year, um, by their parents in almost every case. That is up from about 3.7 million the year before and up from 2.5 million in the fall of 2019. Wow. As you said, the pandemic really sort of showed parents that, you know, they can actually do it because many parents had to. And so it really made parents aware of the possibility, the option of homeschooling their children. And so like, who are the types of families that have decided to take this plunge and, and why? Because it's not easy to do this, right? No, not at all. Um, you know, one of the parents we met in Birmingham, her name was Doella Davis. I am accountable to Zoe and Tyler. They were the gifts I was blessed with. She has two children who she homeschools. Um, they're both um, about 7 and 13 years old. So I want to do everything I can as their mother, along with their father, to give them what they need and what, not what the system is saying they need. Zoe, can you give me one of those little measuring cups? And a big old cup of water. Every day, they start their routine in the morning in the kitchen where they get breakfasts and drinks. She makes smoothies for the kids. Thanks for the H2O. And then they head upstairs to a classroom that they have set up in one of the rooms in their home in the suburbs of Birmingham, Alabama. What part of speech did we talk about last week? Verb. Birds. 
This week we're talking about nouns and pronouns. And she goes through the lesson plans for each of the children. What is a noun? Who can tell me what a noun is? A noun person who is staying at your identity. And this is happening every day across America in growing numbers. I really believe it's growing because people are seeing the difference. One of my reasons, though, of homeschooling is because you're at school all day, and then we got to come home and do homework. And you've already been at school all day, and then your child is exhausted, and they're tired, and you know they're drained, and then you have all these extracurricular activities. And being at home, I can get school done in three to four hours. And in particular, as you point out, the highest increases in the number of families who are homeschooling are in communities of color. When Zoe was in pre-K, I had one of the, um, the ladies that was over the school tell me, and she said it just like this. She said, you have a son and he's black. You cannot all the time just put him where it's just white structured or just, because they're not going to understand. And I know some people can take that negatively, but cultures are different. The largest increase was among black families where the numbers are almost five times as higher as they were um, just the year before. And there are so many different reasons for this. Another mass shooting, this time in Texas. At least 19 children murdered. When he went in the classroom, he said, you're all going to die, and he just started shooting. One of the big concerns that parents have is the safety of their children. They don't like seeing um, those pictures of kids running away from bullets mm. um, with their hands up as they walk out of school. Um, that is a universal complaint. Um, the other thing that we're hearing from these parents is, especially the black parents, is they're very concerned about this debate over the, what history is being taught in our schools. Getting critical race theory out of our schools is not just a matter of values, it's also a matter of national survival. The main buzzword that you hear is CRT, that critical race theory. I'm assuming that you've seen what's happened in, in education with, and it doesn't, it's not something that's attractive to you. It's not attractive. And I want my children to have the best. And I'm gonna give them the best that I can give them. The families that we talked with are concerned that what this really means is that teachers could be told not to share in a classroom the real story of what happened to black people in America. I believe the, you know, curriculums are is whitewashed, to be blunt. That's interesting. Like, one of the big complaints from teachers has been, it's not just been the pandemic, it's coincided with this rise of conservatives telling us, like, we should change what we're teaching. We should have less yeah. sort of politically and racially divisive concepts in the classroom. You're saying this is almost like a, a backlash to the backlash. In some respects. Um, you know, I'll say that the parents who we're talking about who are homeschooling their children um, sort of fall on both sides of the political spectrum, sometimes at the same time. So you have some of these same parents who are concerned about um, how civil rights history is being taught in schools are also telling us that they're also not terribly keen on their children learning about uh, gender issues and sex education. I think sometimes children get exposed too early. To, to things, certain things. To certain things. For and your taste. Yes, for my taste. The other thing we heard from some of the black parents was um, there are studies out there that show that black children, in particular black young, young boys, are more likely to be disciplined for similar behaviors that would go unchallenged or checked or undisciplined with other students. I, I do want to go to high school, but the only thing I'm not going to like is principal's office. Oh, potentially getting in trouble in the principal's office. My youngest son lasted until first grade, but he was actually uh, a victim of racism in kindergarten, first grade. One of the women we talked with, her name was Yolanda, Yolanda Chandler. Um, she is the head of a group in Birmingham called the Black Homeschoolers of Birmingham. She and a woman named Jennifer Duckworth both run this group. You know, I was actively involved with the school. I wanted them to see my face so that my son was not put into targeted. that targeted. Yeah. Yeah. And it yeah. happened anyway. And he still talks about it to this day. And that was the day that she pulled her kid out of school and started homeschooling her child. 
um, and now is homeschooling all of her children. So now what happens is wherever we go, <laughs> we have people coming up to us mm -hmm. and seeking us out. That's how the group has exploded so much. Uh, just in the last month, we've had 43 new members join our community. Just in the last month? In just yes. the month of August. And that leads to my last question, Steve, because I'm, I'm thinking not every parent has the resources to just be like, you know, I don't like this curriculum. I'm pulling my kid out. Not every parent can do this. So I guess I'm just trying to figure out, are there risks, A, that it kind of depletes the educational system from having this very diverse, you know, everyone comes to the same place for public school kind of a vibe? And B, does it just in a country that has been so segregated by race, but also now by political ideologies, is there a chance that we just continue to sort of block ourselves off and withdraw into our own little pods? So it was interesting. One of the parents, the parent who I uh, told you about, Yolanda, mm -hmm. she is a former public school educator. And, and one of the points that she and her partner told us is that they're not anti-public school, they're just pro a different option. Even though we are uh, homeschooling for, we all have a common goal with homeschooling, that we're not a monolith. So we're not all one size fits all. But at the same time, it is hard to look at this and not say how if more parents were, if this trend continues and more and more parents pull their kids out of, out of public schools, this isn't going to be great for public schools. The other thing is the parents who are pulling their kids out of these schools who are homeschooling, are the kind of parents that the public school system needs. They're parents who are involved, parents who are active, parents who are watching their children, parents who are so committed to the welfare of their children that they're willing, <laughs> you know, to spend hours and hours, um, you know, with their children with with lesson plans and which require them to, you know, understand in some cases the material themselves. And yes, your point is a, bi a big one, too. One of the lawmakers we talked with who actually supports the bill in, in Alabama that would prevent schools from teaching what they call divisive concepts, he happens to be black. He's a black Republican. And he said what you just said, which is, you know, these parents should count their blessings in that they're fortunate enough and, and to, to be able to do this. And the parents, they acknowledge that. Anyone who might say, you know, you're privileged to be able to teach your children this way. What do you say to those folks? Well, to, I honestly do think that I am privileged. And I tell my husband all the time, I'm grateful that we have the opportunity to do this. And I would say I don't want people to judge other people, whatever decision they're making for their household. And they wish more parents can do it and are trying to stress that this is a lot easier than parents actually think. Right, because you can talk about the macro all you want. When it's your kid and your family and your community, that's where your focus is going to lie. This very much also just shows where we're at as a country. So great reporting, Steve Osinsami. Thanks a lot. You're more than welcome. Love talking. And one last thing. In all of our studies about hallucinogenic drugs, it's truly mind-bending that we haven't done this before. Our group has been studying a class of molecules called psychoplastogens that act like miracle grow for the brain. Recently, a group of scientists claimed in the journal Nature that they've created drugs that could do some of the same things as LSD without sending you on a psychedelic trip. Because of their ability to regrow these critical neurons, Psychoplastogens actually have the ability to heal the brain, not simply treat disease symptoms. To which your average psychonaut might ask, where's the fun in that? That's 200 micrograms of LSD. That's the full dose to send a normal adult on an 8 to 12 hour trip. Well, in recent years, drug researchers have increasingly found success in using LSD, psilocybin, the magic and magic mushrooms, and even MDMA, commonly known as ecstasy, to treat depression. A lot of different kinds of mental distress relates to being captured or stuck in some previous habits that you've built up. Several studies that have shown under supervision, the drugs may be able to help alleviate some of the symptoms of severe depression. Others have experimented with microdosing, where the benefits are so far 
are a little less clear. But the thinking is that this allows people's brains to become open to new thought patterns, getting out of the harmful ruts and circular thinking that so many people experience. It's like a little rewiring. The biggest catches to these types of therapy, though, are the hallucinations. I would have these thoughts when I was on uh, hallucinogens where I felt like I could rule the world or I had all the answers to the world. Not everyone wants to replace their Lexapro with the feeling they're inside a kaleidoscope. So in this experiment, scientists identify these molecules that have some of the same properties but don't cause hallucinations. That lack hallucinogenic and psychostimulant properties but retain the ability to regrow cortical neurons and heal damaged neurocircuitry. They gave these drugs to mice and the mice didn't give up on things as easily. By the way, you might be asking, how do you tell if a mouse is tripping? Apparently, they move their nose in this very particular way, and in this rave new world, they were behaving pretty much normally. There's still a long way to go in trying these compounds on humans, but several states have been loosening rules on medicinal psychedelics, meaning if this is the biggest leap in depression med since the 80s, some people could be taking trips to avoid a trip. Wonders of science. More on all these stories at abcnews.com or the ABC News app. I'm Brad Milkey. See you tomorrow. Tis time. The real monster fun begins. Get your